Before I introduce our speakers tonight, I just want to thank everybody for being a part of this community. This is the end of our 11th year of doing this, which is, is really cool. And, and we, we've built so many relationships, and, and I mean, not just me with you, but also among yourselves. And I really want to thank you for being part of it. The other thing that we're kicking off is that uh, this year we're going to do an ongoing relationship and alliance with the University District Food Bank. So we're kicking it off tonight. Um, anytime, and I'm not trying to put a burden on anybody, but if you want to bring a, a cash check or a can to any one of these meetings, uh, we're going to have that food uh, barrel down there. and. We can also write you a uh, receipt for tax deduction if you'd like. Uh, so that's something that we're going to be doing forever. <clears throat> so um, that and also uh, Happy New Year and Happy Thanksgiving and Christmas to everybody. <laughs> what I'd like to do is to uh, hand it over to Seth and um, yeah. have, a, yeah, yeah, have a great talk tonight. I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. And Ken and uh, uh, you know Ken kind of in an offhand way for years and years and years because of Ken. But uh, anyway, have a great, great, great time, and everybody enjoy. That's first, right? <laughs> That's part of the deal. Uh, hi there. Uh, we're here to talk to you about leaping into the cloud, uh, wards, risks, and mitigations. So getting to who we are, uh, my name is Seth Elliott. I am with Microsoft, and specifically the uh, Engineering Excellence Group at Microsoft. So if you don't know what Engineering Excellence is, we're fortunate enough at Microsoft to have a group that, that, hand, that handles engineering practices and training and knowledge sharing amongst all the product groups. So I have a great job to talk to all the product groups. But before that, I was with Bing. Before that, I was with another team. Before that, I came from Amazon.com. So the only takeaway about who I am is my history is in services. So talking about the cloud, we are indeed talking about services. And Ken, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself. Thanks. Um, so <clears throat> I've been at Microsoft, and I was just calculating it up. I've been at Microsoft this February 15 years. Um, and almost all of that time, it's been focused on services. Um, back when we launched uh, Windows 95, MSN was our first uh, service, and that launched in 1994. So I've actually been in the services space quite a long time. Um, like uh, like Seth, I got a chance to work in Bing. Uh, we'll share a couple of Bing stories probably tonight. It's a very interesting space, massive scale, thousands and thousands and thousands of servers, and it's its own cloud as well. I um, also got to be a director of test excellence. I was in the engineering excellence team where Seth is now, and that was kind of fun. And also co-authored uh, How We Test Software at Microsoft with uh, Alan Page and BJ Rollison, who I think have both been here a couple of times. Um, and the, the, the little inside story is, it's funny, when I showed up here, um, a bunch of the people that met me at the door started asking me, am I the husband of Karen Johnston? Karen Johnston is my wife, and she is a software test engineer that used to work uh, with some of the people at this company. So it's kind of funny that here I am to talk, and I had to call her up and tell her, everybody's asking me about you and not about me. <laughs> so that's enough about her. No, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so we'll move on from there. Uh, one of the things I like to do is I like to get to know the audience a little bit, kind of know where you're at, So, because Seth and I, we can kind of tailor the message a little bit, spend more time on certain things depending on uh, what your needs are. So I have a couple of questions. We'll do a little kind of show of hands or something like that so I can get a sense of where you're at. Uh, first off, who would say that they're just beginning to learn about clouds or, or just, just a cloud beginner? Okay, well, that's good that we have the, the intro stuff then, good. Uh, who has a major project on cloud where you're going to be moving a service to the cloud or, or something like that in the near future? Great. So some of you need some of this information. And then who has already implemented a, a cloud solution? Anybody kind of getting close to the cloud, the expert level? Okay, so a few of you. So we have the whole range. We're ready for them, Seth. Now, the question I have for you is, those of you that have implemented something in the cloud, has anything ever gone wrong? <laughs> Yeah, something oh, yeah. Wrong. <laughs> something's going wrong in the cloud, and so that's kind of why you know our talk is about not just about what the cloud is, but we're talking about some of the risks and mitigations that you can take uh, when you leap into the clouds to help you prepare better uh, and deal with some of those challenges. 
Um, we're going to kind of break this down into these next several parts. We'll tell you a little bit about clouds, the rewards of the cloud, why you do want to consider moving into the cloud. Seth and I are big supporters and proponents of cloud computing. Um, ways for you to structure and plan moving into the cloud. And then we'll get into the case studies. And as testers, I think we'll find the case studies fairly exciting because almost all of these have a disaster behind them. So it's always good to learn from other people's pain instead of your own. And then I'll talk to you some about <coughs> Some techniques that I've observed in Bing and Microsoft that can help you do better testing in the cloud. So we'll impart some kind of, kind of ideas that you can take with you and, and try to use those you have to move to the cloud. Uh, with that, I think it's Seth's turn to come up and do about cloud. So as you can tell, Seth and I really practiced a ton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a nice slide. I know what to talk about, right? Yes. So uh, yeah, for those of you that are new to cloud, this will be really good for you. For those of you that already know about cloud, I want to hear your feedback as I go along, see if this aligns with what you know, maybe filling in some gaps or might be a little inconsistent with what you know, that's a good conversation to have. So how to define the cloud, right? I mean, I'll start off right now by actually attended a talk about a month ago on, on not really, certainly semi-related to cloud, on, on mobile, on mobile handsets and such. And, and the speaker was making the point that yes, mobile is hyped, but it's not overhyped. Hmm. And I'll make the same thing about cloud. Yes, here, cloud this, cloud that, yes, that's hype. But it's not overhyped in that I don't think it's being, maybe a little bit, <laughs> I don't think it's being sold past where, where as it's important. I think it's pretty important. Now, how you define cloud, there's a lot of different ways to do it. I like this one from James Stabbitt. He's with Forrester. And he defined the cloud in, in three pieces, OK? If it has these three pieces, it's cloud. Number one is a standardized IT infrastructure. What does that mean? That means that it's not customized. Cloud is often thought of as like a utility, like your water or your electric. Well, as an IT consumer, every IT consumer gets the same cloud. Yeah, you might have a different contract. You might have different rate, you know, rates of service. But everybody's getting the same thing. It's sort of like a phone plan. You might have different rates, but everybody's getting the same phone service. What you as an IT consumer do with it is up to you. You could build the most complex service in the world. But it's not up to the cloud provider to support your complex service. They can support the basic needs up to here, and you build on top of that. So it's standardized. It's, it's economies of scale. There's a you know, Model T assembly line to shift the whole drug out. The next thing is paid per use. Remember I said like electricity or phone, you pay for what you use. Maybe not so much with cell phones these days, but electricity, water, you pay for what you use. And people think, oh, that's great. So the more I use, the more I pay. That makes sense. And one of the most important things that Stadden talks about, he actually coined the phrase, the power of zero. So that's what that, that's about. Power of zero, the less you use, the less you pay. And there might be some parts of your system or your entire system that you, don't even, that you can actually shut down at certain points when you don't need it, which means you're not paying anything for it. That's the power of zero. And the third part is about um, self-service. So if we have a, a, a uh, service running in some data center, we probably have an ops team to maintain that data center and, and install everything and, and, and set up the network and do the deployments. With the cloud, it's self-service. We're doing it. We, we the engineers you know, that are, are developing and testing the software, take care of the operational responsibility. So I got DevOps and no ops on there. I don't want to deep dive on that. But basically, there is a ways of saying that the operational responsibility, the role still exists. That, you know, someone has to deploy, someone has to monitor. But it falls upon engineering to do it. So if you have those three things, you have cloud. And oh, James Stabbitt, I was doing, when I was looking, doing a little research, he wrote this uh, originally these three things in 2010. In 2012, just last month, he wrote an article called, You're Running Out of Excuses Not to Try Microsoft Windows Azure. So I like to use that. So what makes the cloud special? Why is the cloud hyped? Why is the cloud important? Well, the secret sauce of the cloud starts out with virtualization. By virtualization, I mean you don't worry about individual servers or hard drives or even network topology. You just ask for compute cores. You ask for gigabytes or terabytes of storage. You ask for bandwidth. And there it is for you. The virtualization layer goes between the hardware. The actual, there are physical servers there back somewhere behind the curtain. But there's a layer, for, layer of abstraction over that. You don't have to worry about that. It's all virtualized. You want more cores? You get more cores. And that's what the second piece is about, elasticity. Virtualization gives you elasticity. Basically, I just said about the power of zero. The more you want, the more you can consume. The more you can consume, the more you can get. And the less you want, you can turn, dial it back down. That's elasticity. I need more power. I need more storage. I need more bandwidth. The cloud offers that, unlike a physical data center, where I have to then schlep in a big server and install it. Right? That's elasticity. 
which leads to the power part of that is when I need power, when I need more compute, I can get it, which theoretically leads to happiness. Now, mm -hmm. sorry, one more. So, so the question is, can this happen automatically, right? Can this elasticity happiness cycle happen automatically? <coughs> yes, it actually can. So this is uh, Netflix streaming services running in the cloud and Amazon Web Services. Any Amazon folks here? I didn't have long. Okay. Um, so it's running the Amazon Web Services, and uh, Amazon Web Services, my laser does not work on the screen, has something called CloudWatch. CloudWatch. And CloudWatch is the monitoring service that Amazon Web Services provides. Netflix was not satisfied with that. They actually added their own libraries on top of that to enhance that, and they created a feedback loop, which you can see here. And that feedback loop means that, look, as CPU goes up, automatically they, de they, they deploy more server, virtual servers in the cloud automatically they spin up more capacity in the cloud. As CPU goes down, they don't want to pay for that, the power of zero, so automatically they give back some of that compute. And that's a very powerful thing. So three layers of cloud. I originally had a lame joke slide in here that you know had three layers of cloud, you know, stratus, you know, nimbulus, I don't know what they are, but it was a lame joke. The only thing I liked from the joke was this picture. So what's that a picture of? XP desktop. XP desktop. So that's why I, that's why I kept that in there. But, yeah. The three layers of cloud really look like this, okay? And it's a stack, and I'm going to start at the top of the stack, okay? The software as a service. I can't see from here the screen because oh. you're standing in front of it. Uh, where should I stand? Right. Here? Is this better? Am I blocking Oh, anybody? I don't know if you're blocking those people. Am I blocking those people? No. Okay, I'm going to stand here. Thank you're you. Me, okay. Thank you for letting me know that. Okay, so I'm going to start at the top of the stack which is software as a service. And we think of software as a service that is cloud. And what is software as a service? It's something as simple as Gmail or Hotmail, which is now Outlook.com. Or it doesn't have to be consumer facing. It actually could be uh, Salesforce.com is often thrown out as a good example. They're, they're a uh, CRM, customer relationship management system in the cloud. These things that you used to install on your desktop, like an uh, email client or on, in your data center, a CRM system, now being run for you by somebody. That's software as a service. And that's actually the least of what we're going to talk about here as developers and testers, but still at the top of the stack of the cloud. I'm going to move to the bottom of the stack, infrastructure as a service. That's pretty much what I've been talking about already. That's servers, that's storage, that's even network available to you raw on tap. And then you put what you want on top of it, what operating systems and what applications you want on top of it. That's infrastructure as a service. That leaves the middle of the stack. Platform or service. That's why I got to it last. So it's in between. It's a little harder to, visual, to visualize, but it's not software as a service. It's not fully formed software. And it's more than infrastructure. Think about a relational database. A relational database is not just storage, but it's organization and a query engine. If someone offers you a relational database in the cloud, that's platform as a service. Azure offers a .NET platform in the cloud. You can deploy .NET applications to it without do anything else, and they'll run for you. So that's platform as a service. So any, any questions on the stack from infrastructure <coughs> to platform to software as a service? Yes? What's the differentiation between app and data integration? What's the differentiation between app and data integration? Because they do exist at the cloud layer. I mean, applications, transactions, data is itself you know, that service that you're offering. So how does that map to that stack? Um, so I'm not exactly sure. So applications are obviously. If the application is end user facing and software as a service, if your uh, cloud facility is providing some kind of data transactionalization or data storage, it can be a platform or infrastructure depending on, on whether it's providing vanilla blob storage or whether it's actually adding some value on top of that. Okay. Yeah. So just to say, you know, again, I talk about clouds are hyped, but is it worth the hype? This is what I'm trying to show is it is worth the hype. So it's shown here that in, in um, oh, years got cut off. Okay, so the, the left one is 2012, the right one is 20, uh, 2000, left one is 2010, and the right one is 2015, and it's showing 1.1 zettabytes of, of data center traffic per year in 2010, going up to 4.8 in 2015, which is, I think, quadrupling, but it's showing that the, the dark green part, the actual part of that that's cloud, is increasing by 12-fold during that period. Anybody know how big a zettabyte is? It goes uh, terabyte, petabyte, exabyte, zettabyte. So that's pretty huge stuff. Now, um, this is a little bit old now. This is about a year old, this slide. This is showing Amazon Web Services. And that in the course of just one year, these last two bulk bars here, in the course of just one year, they doubled the number of objects they had in their S3 storage. And just continuing our, our clouds for real, 
This is showing that Azure now has 816,000 compute cores running in the, in, in the cloud. These are virtualized compute cores. Now, how many physical <coughs> compute cores, I don't know. But 816 virtualized, virtualized compute cores running applications and, and, and storage, which is more than all the compute cores that existed in reality in 1999. So, okay, so that's a little bit of intro to the cloud. Um, I told you a little bit about the power of zero elasticity being a good thing, but let's talk about so what are some of the other good things about the cloud, what can you get out of it? And believe me, I'm not gonna be all um, uh, uh, just uh, rose, rose colored glasses. This is about risks and mitigations too, but we need to talk about the rewards first. So, and the cloud, well actually, I'm already gonna take off the rose colored glasses. And I was saying the cloud makes many promises, but most of those promises can't be fulfilled unless you, as an engineer, as a software professional, leverage those. And that's really what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the cloud promise and how you leverage it, what you get out of it. So yeah, the cloud promise plus your reactions equals your rewards. And this is what it looks like. This is the 40,000 foot view, another name, cloud joke. But um, so, that, <laughs> so these are uh, the seven categories we're going to go through. Where the left one is the promise that the cloud makes. And just because my laser doesn't work doesn't mean I won't click it. I promise you, I'll keep it. <laughs> <laughs> the ones on the left are the um, promises that the cloud's making, and the right is how you base it, how you conceptualize that and actually take advantage of that. And we actually talked about the cloud offers a promise of on-demand capacity, and you can then uh, elasticity, and you can use that to get on-demand capacity for your service. So we already talked about that one. Let's talk about the other six. So lower costs. Everybody's interested in lower costs, right? That probably sounds like a good thing. How can the cloud give you lower costs? Well, Look at this, asset utilization, data center utilization for your average service, average data center is five to 20%. That means that the average data center owned by a company that's running their services is only using five, five to 20% of its resources and the other resources are just sitting there idle. They paid for them, they paid for this capacity, but it's not being used and why would that be? Well, Ken's gonna talk about this in more detail later, but this little graph on the right just shows a CPU over time for a data center, and you see it does spike up to 100%. You need your data center, your physical data center, to be able to handle 100% load or you're out, but it turns out that those peaks only happen every so often, so you end up with a lot of waste. The advantage of the cloud is this, that the data center is not owned by you, it's owned by the cloud provider. When you want resources, let the cloud provider to slot you in. Right? You don't have to worry about having unused resources. You only pay for what you use. It's the cloud provider that worries about how to get you the resources you need and where they come from. So I thought it was a little bit like a game of Tetris. And uh, talking about, continuing talking about costs. Hardware costs. When you run your own data center, when you have your own servers, how do you improve hardware performance? You buy new hardware. Expensive, uh, kind of a pain to do, not something you're going to do all the time. With a cloud service, with a reputable cloud provider, they're always buying new hardware. They're always cycling out the old and cycling in the new. So you always have the latest and greatest. Power efficiency. This is a little bit in the weeds. It's a little bit, little bit complex. But so if I say power efficiency, the closer it is to one, the lower it is, the more efficient your data center is. The higher the number, the more energy you're wasting not going towards your actual service, being wasted on other things like air conditioning and, and other things, right? So the power efficiency for an average industry data center is 2.0, but the power efficiency for an average Microsoft data center is 1.2 or 1.15. That's not just to say Microsoft's great, hooray, I mean, we are happy about our green data centers, but it's to say that if you're using the cloud, whether it's Microsoft, Google, or Amazon, you're probably used to using less power because we know how to run data centers and make them more power efficient. And less power means less cost. Continuing the low cost, Discussion. I'm not going to read every bullet on this slide, but again, when you're running your own data center, and these are all shots from actual Microsoft data centers, you have to worry about your own security, your own acquisition pipeline, your personnel costs. Cloud, don't worry about this at all. We take care of it for you. The cloud provider takes care of it for you. And finally, about cost, there's an economy of scale. If you're running a data center, you might be running a fairly small data center. If you're in the cloud, you're probably in a very large data center. And it turns out the total cost of ownership per server goes down substantially from a 1,000 server data center to a 100,000 server data center. So unless you're prepared to run your own 100,000 data server, you send a 100,000 server data center, then maybe the cloud might be for you. Now I'm gonna talk about disaster recovery and fault tolerance together in this, in, in this slide, because there's a few different points that are sort of uh, self-reinforcing. 
So how does the cloud help you with disaster recovery and fault tolerance? Well, multiple smaller servers, why is that good? So if you're, if you're running your own server farm, you're probably going to buy a few big honking servers to be able to handle your, your system. It's, I think it's more expensive and more complex to have a lot of little servers. But a lot of little servers is better because that gives you redund better redundancy. In other words, if one of your big honking servers goes out, you lose 50% of your capacity, you'd rather have 10 little servers and only lose 10% of your capacity when one server goes out. Well, in the cloud, again, it's all virtual, it's all abstracted away. You can, you can spin up a bunch of small servers and you get that advantage. Now, again, the, the actual physical servers running data center might be big honking things, but your small servers that you're spinning up are these virtualized servers. Um, you'd be able to handle load spikes. That often brings us down. They used to call it the slash dot effect. That sounds kind of old to me now. I don't know what you call it now. Maybe the Reddit effect would be old. Boy, I'm really out of the loop, aren't I? Um, so being able to handle elastic uh, spikes when they hit you, again, that, that power of elasticity gives you that resiliency. Um, being able to do backups is important, right? And with the cloud, you have the ability to access on-demand storage, on-tap storage. And I'll show you later how that storage might even be geo-redundant and you just back up your data into the cloud so that if you have an issue, you can restore it. And uh, having the access to these tools to do a lot of this stuff programmatically, so it doesn't have to be a human and a UI, but you could write actually scripts and programs that take care of this for you. <clears throat> but sometimes the cloud's gonna let you down. You know, you might back up and, and the backup might not be accessible or whatever. For some reason, the cloud might be out. Let's talk about what happens with that a little later. Number five, ease of management. I kind of hinted at this earlier when I was talking about APIs. So the cloud does give you that ease of management as opposed to running your own data center where you might have good interfaces in that data center, you might not. The cloud, since it's a commodity, since they're trying to sell it, they're trying to uh, commercialize it, they provide us, developers and testers, engineers, excellent interfaces to access our systems in the cloud. So here's Amazon Web Services and their UI. One of the bottom is actually more important, but they provide APIs to be able to configure and monitor your servers and load balancers, balancers in Amazon Web Services. In Microsoft Azure, here's what the Microsoft Azure UI looks like, and it was recently updated over the summer, I think. And you can see here, I've chosen I want to create a website, and then I say I want to view one, I want to take one out of the gallery, and I say, oh, okay, here's the things, websites I can create, this is all in Azure. I'll create a WordPress website, and boom, it's running, and I get metrics back on it immediately. So that's a nice interface, a nice UI interface for, uh, for the cloud that, that is an uh, advantage for us engineers. But just like the Amazon case, I think the more powerful example is the APIs. So here's all the different API groups. These are not individual APIs, these are groups of APIs that Azure offers. Let's drill in. Operations on hosted services. A hosted service is your service running in Azure. You can list them, create them, update them, delete them. You have access, all the access you need to programmatically manipulate bring up, bring down your services. <clears throat> and item six is about service level uh, agreements, your service guarantees. <clears throat> a lot of numbers here, right? And not really meant for you to read this. But what's meant to just be a takeaway is that different cloud providers, cloud providers offer different guarantees and, and they offer cloud guarantees for their compute and for their storage. So it, it computes about availability, storage is about transaction availability and data integrity, et cetera. This is all about if the cloud is not available and your service is, is impacted, what do you get? You get service credits. You get money. Do you get money to compensate you for lost business? No. You get money refund of what you paid for the cloud. Now, then, wow, that's interesting. So it says SLAs, what are they good for? Well, um, this happened when I changed it to Sega. Um, SLAs, what are they good for? Well, service credits are not likely to make your customers happy, right? If your customers were unable to reach your service and you lost them, or you're unable to transact their business, service credit's not gonna do you a lot of good. So what are SLAs good for? They're, they're limited in what they're good for. They're basically a first stop on your comparison shopping. You compare the stated SLAs for one cloud service to another. You can do a little bit of searching on the web and find out who's reliable and who's not, who's missed their SLAs and had to pay out and who's not. And, and all in all, when you're looking at the SLAs, remember that 99.9% .9 uptime is still nine hours a year down. So you have to assess your business needs. Is nine hours a, a year down acceptable or do I need 0.9 or do I need less? Assessing your business needs, looking at the state of SLAs, comparing is your first step. 
But in the end, it's up to you, and we're going to talk a lot about this, to architect defensively. You can't count on the cloud being there. You can't count on the cloud always being available. So number seven is about easy integration. Um, easy integration means that when you're using a cloud service provider, you've got your application in the cloud, but you also have the storage, databases, web service, the content data networks, which are just edge cache uh, servers for media, all in the same cloud, all offered by the same cloud provider, whether it's Amazon or Microsoft. And why is that good? Because then it's more, it's easy to integrate. It's easier to monitor this whole stack. Your service, your application in the cloud is not going to be just probably one, uh, one application. It's going to be a stack of services that together serve a need, right? So having that availability and interoperability all in the same cloud with the same provider has the advantages of simplicity, management, and monitoring. Uh, this here is just an example of one application that you might deploy to a cloud. It's a video download service. And what I'm trying to show here is that, oh, someone goes to make a purchase and it's going to hit a web server in the cloud. Then it's going to create an order which goes to an order DB in, the, in that same cloud provider. And it's going to add the, the movie you bought to a queue service in that same cloud. And when you go to download it, it's going to consult the queue service and then place a request to a CDN, which is actually storing the actual movie. And then it's going to download the movie. All this stuff this entire stack in the same cloud with the same provider. So getting to the cloud, uh, that's some of the reward. Before we jump into getting to the cloud, any questions on what I've said so far? Yes? Yeah, actually, it's, it's taking, for example, Microsoft Quincy as an example. What do you do to deal with the daily peak or the daily cycle of maybe it's 3 a.m. specific time, but you know, I know that the, the traffic in Asia and Europe is taken care of by more likely about other services because of limited bandwidth, but then 9 a.m. the so is not a problem. Are you asking from the point of view of people running Quincy, the data center, or from the point of view of you as a, someone running an application on the cloud? Uh, maybe both, but you can start with the data center. Well, from the data center, it, it's actually a little bit outside the scope of this talk, right? That's okay. sort of like the magic that they do to be able to enable uh, capacity to be on tap when people ask for it, and, that, and, that, and that's actually it's not an easy problem to solve, and that's why cloud providers add value. <coughs> so I can't really address that too much. Okay. For you, as someone running something in the cloud, it goes back to what I said about the on-tap elasticity. If your cloud provider is reliable, you'll be able to spin up and spin down capacity as you need it. Yeah. Yeah. So, Anything else? All right, Ken, I'm going to hand it over to you to talk about getting into the cloud. Uh, I do have a case study coming up. We'll talk some about that, and I'll share a little bit about Bing and some of the things we discovered and why we have multiple data centers. So if I forget that when I get into BCP, you can ask the question again. All right, so getting into the cloud. Um, this is actually a model that, that I found uh, on Amazon's website, and it was, it's kind of a useful way to look at how you get into the cloud. Um, and uh, I encourage you to go ahead and go find it and read it if you want. But let me walk you through some of the key points uh, from this. Uh, the first phase that we're really going to talk a lot about is this cloud assessment phase. You have to kind of spend some time uh, assessing uh, your service to see uh, what you need to do in order to uh, get yourself into the cloud. Um, you want to assess your costs, uh, the access architecture, and your security needs. Those are some of the key components you need to think about when you're designing your service. Do you need to have a private cloud? Can it work on a public cloud? Uh, different things like that. We just announced a deal today or yesterday where I guess we're doing 600,000 users on Office 365 for the US government. And guarantee that has some definite security requirements associated with it. So it'll be on a kind of a, at least a, a semi-private cloud uh, with those services. So that'll have some additional security. So those are some of the things you want to take a look at in terms of assessing what your cloud needs are going to be so you can pick the correct cloud provider. Um, <clears throat> the other thing you want to assess too is like how much storage and bandwidth and things you need. There's a couple of tools that I have a reference here for. Uh, Microsoft has a tool to help you assess uh, how you plan to move to, to Azure. Amazon has tools like this and so does Google, so you can go ahead and take those. This one from Microsoft works really well if you happen to have a Microsoft stack, so it'll actually analyze your SQL Server, analyze your web front end, and come up with recommendations for how you should move it to the Microsoft Cloud. Why do we do these tools? Because we want you to move to the cloud. So, you know, if you want to assess other cloud providers, I'm sure they have good tools as well. Um, so then the next step is really to focus on how you're going to do your proof of concept. 
So this would be for an organization that's maybe, you know, has never done a cloud service before. You're about to try it for the first time. So it makes sense like anything we do, like if you were going to upgrade to the next version of Windows, you're not going to do everything all at once. So here you're going to move to another operating system, a cloud operating system, and in this case we should do the proof of concept. Uh, right here, uh, a couple of things I want to call out of this is that it's, and we've done this a lot of times in groups that I've been, where we'll build a trial service. Maybe it's not even like the one that we're going to migrate. In fact, quite often one of the first things that we will put into the cloud will be some test automation. So maybe we're going to have a service that we're going to move into the cloud. We want to try to take our tests and have them run from the cloud to hit the existing uh, web service. So that's one of the things we'll do, just so we can learn what are the risks and challenges as a group of making something run in the cloud, but it's a low risk thing, it's some test automation, and we learn from that. So that's one of the steps that we often do. Uh, data migration uh, is quite commonly the next phase. It doesn't have to be. A lot of companies, and you'll hear some examples here where they have a hybrid model where they might run their web servers, but cloud storage has really become pretty darn reliable and fairly cheap, so it's fairly common if you migrate a component of your service, you might make or migrate the data piece before you uh, migrate the service stack. And then last, the last phase is quite often uh, migrating the application stack to the cloud, okay? And then you want to do these also as prototypes because this is really the prototyping phase. So start maybe with a trial service, start with some test data of the real service, see if you can access it, and then try a test version of the real service in the cloud. Um, uh, types of contracts. Contract, contract different pricing. Oh, yeah, I wanted to cover some too. This is the next thing you're going to want to do. Once you've assessed your, your needs in terms of your cloud, you want to pick the different kinds, you want to pick the correct kind of provider. Um, there's different kinds of pricing that you have. The cloud providers might offer Windows or Linux or both, so you're going to need to keep that into mind. And you're going to, on the security thing, one of the common things you run into is the different kinds of certifications the cloud has. Europe has different certification requirements. The US government often requires FISMA, which is a kind of a federal information security uh, uh, compliance. So there's a lot of clients. There's, uh, there's some requirements on cloud for HIPAA as well. The European Safe Harbor is another kind of, of that. So if you're working with Europe, you got to check what uh, kind of certifications your cloud uh, provider has. <coughs> All right, so to pick the right cloud provider. Uh, believe it or not, there's actually several tools out there that are cloud tools that you can now take your requirements and put them in this cloud tool and it'll help you pick a cloud provider. It shows you things like what's their SLA, what kind of operating systems they use, how they charge for storage, how they charge for bandwidth. So you can use any one of these and kind of just, hey, what's one of the better clouds for me to look at? And you know, it always comes up with some of the top ones, but you can look at a next tier uh, local cloud provider. The last time we looked, there was a all, at least in the U.S., more than 100 cloud providers out there to pick from. So go check out one of these tools and take a look at it. Lots of variations. Uh, you can also research the cloud provider, see what their uptime is like and how successful they are. Uh, so that would be, you know, it's, it's perfectly fine to not go with one of the big, uh, big cloud providers. You just have to understand your business needs and uh, uh, what your requirements and your SLA are. Okay? All right, so with that, we're going to go into, so I did click that one slide. I'm going to go back to my uh, uh, case study slide. So something I put it out here. go back to these. And then so five and six on this thing here. Five and six, uh, leveraging the cloud and then optimization phase. Those are the last two phases. Once you get into the cloud, uh, once you get into the cloud, one of the things we find quite often is that you're not done. You have to figure out how to optimize your cloud. Your first is, it's kind of basically your crawl, walk, run. So your crawl is kind of your experiment and your prototype. Your walk is to get it up and running. And then you'll need to run. And you'll see from these case studies that we're going to cover here in the next couple of minutes, just big, big players that are smart, that have been doing cloud for a long time, make mistakes. So it takes you a while to actually nail all this stuff down. You have to plan for problems to come up. Okay. So with that in mind, I'm going to go into our first case study. And this is where it starts to get fun, especially for those of you that have dealt some with the cloud in the past. Uh, we're going to break these, these uh, case studies down into uh, uh, risks, mitigations, and rewards. So uh, there's always a risk in changing the new technologies. There are things we're going to suggest that you can do to mitigate some of those risks and then uh, cover the reward that you'll get for moving to the cloud. Okay? And all of our cool animation I'm just <laughs> So let me cover this one here. This one is, is a case study 
that actually I'd encourage you to go watch the video. It's only about a 10 minute or 15 minute video. If you just search for John Jenkins Velocity uh, Culture, you'll see it. It's well worth watching. He's a guy from Amazon and he explains some of the stuff that the Amazon uh, team, he worked on the, their commerce piece and it explains some of the stuff that they went through as they migrated to the Amazon cloud. So the Amazon built their cloud and then, uh, but their, their retail business wasn't necessarily fully on that cloud for a long time. So it kind of walks you through that. I'm going to walk you through some of the highlights. This is one of the, this kind of covers the thing that we were talking about, the spikiness of the web. And this was Amazon took a look at it and said, hey, look, we have to build our service and we have to make sure that we can deal with maximum capacity, right? So we have to know what the maximum number of users at the peak time of the day is, right? Uh, and then on top of that, you know what we have to do? We probably have to add a buffer in on top of that because, you know, where we're at today, we're going to try to grow. So we have to have some buffer because it takes a long time to order hardware. So if we're going to be able to sustain growth, we have to order more hardware than we need today so that we have that buffer. And then also we have those, you know, we have those unexpected spikes, right? Well, then when they calculated that, they said, hey, look at that. If you actually added up all that white space above the curve, we're actually wasting 39% of our capacity on a weekly basis. That's a lot of wasted money just because of the way we've architected the service. But you know what? It gets even worse than that. So then Amazon said, hey, let's take a look at one of our most unusual months of the year, November. What happens in November in just another week or two from now? A couple of these major events called Black Friday and Cyber Monday, huh? So Amazon has to build out for those peaks of utilization of their e-commerce platform, and they have to have a buffer on top of that. So when they got all their smart people together and they analyzed this, they said to themselves, wow, do you realize that we are wasting 76% of our capacity because we have dedicated hardware and we have to plan for all of these spikes and we have to have this long trail to procure more hardware because it takes months to get it into the data center and build it out and all of this stuff. So it's just an amazing amount of waste. I mean, you might as well be just dumping money down the toilet, right? Um, and to make it even worse on top of that, a lot of traditional web service architectures, when you think about deployments and you think about your service going out there, a lot of them build out a service. We're going to have a case study here in a few minutes about active and passive. And so not only did they have the, the excess capacity they needed for, for spikes, they had to have stuff for, okay, we need to take this cluster down to upgrade it. Well, that cluster comes out of production. So now we have to have, if say that cluster was 10% of the total capacity, but we have to have another 10% in the rest of that stuff to cover that cluster coming out. So now we're up to 80 something percent waste. And then you need to build uh, buffers on top of your buffers um, and a lot of these services. And the thing is, is that if you're going to be like Amazon, and this is why I think they got here ahead of some of us, because they've always been focused on being this low cost retailer, right? That was one of their big things. They were not cash flush like some of the other high tech companies out there. Some of the things I would say we did 10 years ago in Microsoft building services, you would never do unless you had a stupid amount of money to throw at it. <laughs> you would not come up with some of the architectures we've done. This makes sense if you're trying to run a lean business and it leads you down to the path of saying, hey, maybe I should do this cloud storage. Maybe I should do this cloud compute, the power of zero and all the things we we're talking about. So here's the thing, even though Amazon's kind of one of the early movers into this cloud stuff, it actually took them until November of 2010 to fully migrate their e-commerce solution into their own cloud. And they've been in the cloud space for a while. Uh, they've been able to reduce spending on server capacity. Um, fleet scale dynamically in increments as small as a single host. So if it's Black Friday and they need, they need you know, 500 more uh, MIPS or something like that, We'll bring on another VM and handle it. The load backs off, goes away. They pay for it in real time what they need. They don't have to have all of this capacity parked around. Uh, traffic spikes are handled with ease. And we'll get into this as long as you actually design your service correctly. <laughs> uh, the other thing too is that they had a cultural change that he talks about. This is why you do need to go back and, and watch the video so you can hear it from, from, uh, from Amazon in itself. Uh, but it helps them to aim for small footprints. And that's one of the interesting things about service components is then you start to break them down into these smaller discrete components. Because one of the thing, mistakes a lot, of team, a lot of services do is when you're buying the hardware, they try to cobble things together on a single machine so they can maximize the use of that machine. That adds complexity and that adds overhead in your engineering cycle. 
when you can break it down into VMs, and even if that VM only uses you know two percent of a core or something like that, you can even share VMs within a core if you wanted to. Okay. So you could do those things. So they go from a small footprint. Okay. Uh, so now let me tell you my next case study. It's about business continuity, and this is a real story that I really personally experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so there was a, and I actually was part of Bing, and I actually Thank was. You. So, I was test manager for this service uh, in Microsoft uh, and Bing about a year or so ago. But this actually happened before I became the test manager. So in, uh, in uh, 2008, we acquired a company called uh, Faircast. Faircast is a service that lets us uh, do, among other things, uh, predictions in terms of what the price of your flight is going to be. So today I checked, and if I wait a little while before booking a flight to Hawaii, I'll probably save some money. So I did not book a flight to Hawaii today, and I probably won't in case my wife is watching. Anyhow, so that's what the service was. Well, here's the thing about when we bought the service. The, the service was housed in a single data center in downtown Seattle. And we had talked about building it out in a second data center is for data center. We talked about doing it, but for more than a year or two, we didn't do that because of budget. It was just kind of expensive. This was not a cloud service. This was actually even a Unix-based service or Linux-based service, and so we had a lot of challenges there. So we didn't actually deal with migrating it there. So we went for a couple of years without any sort of a safety net. Well, so finally in 2009, disaster strikes. And I have to tell you how I discovered this. I was sitting at home, and my wife has this game that she likes to play. I think it was Bejeweled Blitz, and I think it ran on Facebook. And she's using it, and for some reason it stops working. Oh. And so then she says, why is the internet not working? Mm -hmm. And I don't, said, I don't know. Let me see if there's anything about an earthquake or something, because I hear this data center somewhere in Seattle. No, there was no earthquake. In fact, when I turned on the TV, I couldn't get our local news channel, because it was not on the air. And I turned on the radio for one of the local news radio stations to see if there was something that could tell me what was up. And that local news radio station was not on the airwaves. They could find out that all three of those, uh, along with this game company and along with our Faircast system, were actually housed in Fisher Plaza in the basement in the data center. And there was a big electrical fire and it took out the entire data center. Well, the, of all of those, there's only one service that actually made a big splash on the web, and that was Microsoft's travel service goes down. So believe it or not, shortly after that, we decided that we should probably put the service in more than one data center. I mean, it took us two years and a major outage for us to figure out that a single point of failure will always fail if you don't take care of it. So Bing is now in more than one data center, uh, and uh, we definitely have some redundancy. The other thing I want to leave you with is to think not just redundancy across data centers these days, but as we discovered recently, you need to think really seriously about geo-redundancy. Anybody remember a, a small <coughs> storm that happened in the upper northeast not too long ago? <laughs> something that had something to do with sand on a beach or something like that? Well, apparently there are a couple of major services that people have heard about, such as the Huffington Post and Gizmodo, that apparently had their assets all in data centers in the island of Manhattan and experienced major disruptions to their services. And fortunately, they had access to Twitter so that they could let the world know that they were down. Uh, so you ought to think not just about more than one data center, you have to think about more than one region of the world because disaster will strike at some point. And especially with these cloud providers, that's another thing when you assess them, see what their geo distribution is like. If they're all in California with their cloud, there's going to be an earthquake there someday that's going to take them down for several days. So you got to think about that. The great thing too, though, is that if you move to the cloud, uh, you actually end up with geo redundancy if you do one of the proper uh, proper cloud providers. So uh, this is one of the maps we have out about Microsoft and some of the data centers that we're in around the world. Oh, your question about the, the global load and stuff like that. So one of the things we do in, in Microsoft <coughs> is we've actually analyzed things. And believe it or not, we try not to service uh, service uh, uh, Hong Kong from the US data centers because of latency. Mm -hmm. But we do have redundancy so that if the Hong Kong data center has issues, you can get your traffic from the US. Or if you had to take the Hong Kong data center down, you could get your service served from one of the other data centers. So we have that in the plans, but we try to actually get traffic closer to the actual endpoint. And so that's one of the design points that we have, especially in Bing. We do a lot of work to optimize that because our bandwidth is expensive and, and latency is important to users in terms of results. We optimize to get traffic to the nearest data center, but we design for redundancy and dynamic failover. So if we lose one of those, 
or we have to take it out for maintenance. Or actually, some of the things we do in maintenance, we actually take data centers out of rotation uh, on purpose every week just to test BCP. I have another axiom that I say, BCP will always fail you unless you exercise it all the time. So one of the back to the Gizmodo thing, there was another story from the article where a team, where some a data center had diesel generators, but they ran out of gas. <laughs> and another one had battery backup, but the batteries didn't kick in when the power failed. So your BCP systems will always fail unless you exercise, or as we like to call it, test them. But you need to test them regularly. You can't just do it once and think that it won't fall apart. So with that, I think we're on to Seth. Therefore, you have geo redundancy. Seth is back up. Right. Actually, I don't want to go back to the slide. I like this slide because I found this slide and it's one that we're allowed to show the public. Microsoft has more than 10 and less than 100 data centers worldwide. And if that's not enough obfuscation for you, this slide is about a year old. So you can ignore that too. <laughs> I told you enough that you accept a lot of data centers. <laughs> okay. So yes, well, Ken was saying you need geo redundancy. And unless you're like a major multinational corporation who wants to build data centers around the world, how do you do that? You do it with the cloud, right? You get you to work through the redundancy in the cloud. For instance, if you're on Azure, it looks like these are a little small, I apologize. If you're on Azure, you, you basically have the ability to load balance your traffic to the best data center. So your traffic comes in and it'll automatically figure out which data center to send it to if you're in multiple data centers. Uh, and this is useful for two things, for performance, you can be serving users, just like Ken was saying we do for Bing, although it's not on the cloud, serving from the best possible data center, but also it's for failover. If one's down, then the other one's still going to serve your requests. Uh, Amazon S3 storage, data is replicated over multiple locations, such as failure modes are independent of each other. The locations are chosen with great care. <laughs> Seriously, so it means that if one is in a floodplain in Virginia, the other one is not going to be anywhere in that near that floodplain. You know, one's in California on the San Andreas Fault, and the other one's going to be somewhere else, right? That's what they mean by that. They really mean that. Uh, Google Cloud Storage, we replicate data to multiple data centers and serve an end user's request from the nearest data center that holds the copy of the data. That's about performance. So you, you, if you're in the cloud, you have geo redundancy. Or do you? Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. So who's this happy guy about? Well, anybody know what happened on that day? April 21st, 2011. Well, according to Wikipedia, mm -hmm. that is the date that Skynet began its attack on humanity. <laughs> so I want to go into a deep dissertation on the Terminator movies now. No. Yeah. Um, it is, uh, that is in Wikipedia, so that's part of the Terminator canon. But something else actually happened on that date as a result of Skynet's attack, obviously. <laughs> which was Amazon Web Services went down. Yes, Skynet began its attack on humanity by picking up Amazon Web Services. Go figure. Because if Skynet knew that without Quora, Foursquare, and Hootsuite, we were finished. Because all those guys are hosted on Amazon Web Services, and Amazon Web Services went down, so they went down. Makes sense, right? But it doesn't have to be that way, right? So the cloud let these guys down, and let them take them down with them. How about one website that had reason to be smug? This was a website called SmugMug. SmugMug is a photo hosting site, and they were not down, even though they too are hosted on Amazon Web Services. They were minimally impacted, and all major services remained online. Netflix also was on AWS and also stayed up. We'll talk about them a little bit later. We'll talk about SmugMug now. So the point of this slide is that even, like I said earlier with the SLAs, you have to, if your business requirements require high availability, now keep in mind that some business requirements don't require high availability. But if your business requirements require high availability, you must design for redundancy. Don't be this guy. So this guy, you know, this is on the date uh, after the outage, April 22nd, 2011. This is on Amazon support forums and says, the, lives of, the life of our patients is at stake. I'm desperately asking you to contact. We, we're an EKG monitor, ECG monitoring company, and we can't access the ECGs. Now, it's kind of dark humor. I, hopefully, I don't think anybody was hurt in, in this incident. But does that mean that this guy should not be in the cloud? It doesn't mean that. It means, though, that they did not, his company did not think through their design for failure in the cloud, their design for redundancy. So SmugMug did think that through. So the ECG guy, guys don't have a uh, design for failure, and the photo hosting site does. It seems kind of funny, kind of backwards. Engineers <laughs> do strange things. <laughs> How did SmugMug stay up? Well, this is a little snippet from the um, status reports the day of the outage. And if you'll notice, that indeed, North Virginia the North Virginia data center is dead as a doornail, right? But look, California is still running. 
That's the point. Amazon has these things called availability zones. And an Amazon availability zone is just a virtual data center. That's all it is. And basically, Amazon makes the promise that failures will not span availability zones. So if you're in two availability zones and one goes down, the other one should continue running. Guess what happened on April 21st, 2011? Two went down. So they can make these promises, but they can't always keep them. Smug Mug uses three availability zones plus some secret sauce they won't share with the public to actually maintain their resiliency and stay up, even though that kind of thing happens. Smug Mug is designed to fail and recover. They, they say that any other instances or group of instances can be shot in the head, and the system will continue running. And also, they have really good incident response stories. So this is not necessarily about staying up, but it's about letting your users know about degradation in service and what's going on. Sort of like Gizmodo did in that case, about keeping, it's part of your resiliency stories, keeping your users informed so they don't go away. So how do you do it? Well, as I said, multiple availability zones, or in Azure's case, I pulled Azure regions. This was a list of Azure regions I pulled off uh, about six months ago plus this whole traffic management concept that I talked about before, that um, you could uh, have services in multiple data centers, multiple virtual data centers, and route the traffic appropriately. And then as for storage, as for data, there's two kinds of storage I'm showing you from Azure. Azure local redundant storage and global redundant storage. Local redundant storage means that it's redundant within the same data center, which means that if like a server goes out, another server will another a disk drive goes out, another disk drive will have your data, and it's fine. But if the whole data center goes out, you're offline. That's why we have global redundant storage. Global redundant storage says the entire data center goes out, your data's fine, it's in another data center. Global redundant storage costs more. <coughs> so you have to make the decision, do I want to spend the money up front for global redundant storage and maintain that high building now? Or am I willing to take the risk? And this is not, I'm not saying this in a negative way, it's a totally legitimate decision. I'm only take the risk and not pay for it now because that's an ongoing cost and if it does go down I'll take the actions and the costs involved, uh, involved with that later. And that's a decision you have to make for your own service. Either one is valid. You're just buying insurance. Yeah, you're, you're buying insurance and you want to pay for, pay for the house fire. Good, 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 good analogy. I'll have, to, I'll have to use that next time. <laughs> uh, now talking about this it, into the, into the topic of fault tolerance seems to be a, a natural segue here. Well, what do you need to worry about if you actually aren't in the cloud, if you're running your own data center? The fact is failure is always going to happen in data centers. Data centers are chaotic places. I'm going I'm to illustrate this with the, with the Netflix story, but I'm actually going to shoot over to Google first and talk about the first year of a new data center at Google, because they release stats on this. Read some of these things. Uh, a one rack move will happen where 500 to 1,000 machines will be offline. 20 rack failures will happen. 12 routers will reload and three routers will fail. And 1,000 machines will fail and thousands of hard drives will fail in the first year of a new data center. This is meant to point out to you that data centers are, are, are chaotic, are dangerous places in a lot of ways. So if you're actually just hosted in a data center, this kind of thing is going to happen. So what's the cloud story here? How can the cloud help? Well, on one hand, I'll try, I can make the point that the cloud is better. <coughs> when you're actually using the cloud, you got experts, for lack of a better word, right? You got the fault tolerant hardware, the expert built network infrastructure, you got the advanced ops working in that data center. In other words, you're, you're using the data center of the cloud provider that has all this, these advantages, state-of-the-art power, cooling, and security. That's great. There's, there's Azure and there's Amazon. Well, not really, right? I mean, I already told you that the cloud goes out, right? So it may be more likely to stay up than just some random data center, but it's still going to go out. So basically, the advantage of the cloud is not so much this, that the cloud is better, that has better hardware, better people. It does, maybe. I don't know. But that, that's not really the advantage. The advantage here is the cloud is going to give you tools to embrace failure. You have to embrace failure. You can't run away from it. You can't avoid it. You have to know that failure is going to happen in your infrastructure and how do you handle it with cloud, aka how do you design defensively. So how do you do that? Well, number one is each system, just like the smug mug, you know, shot in the head example, each system has to be succeed even on its own. Uh, Netflix calls it the Rambo architecture, which is meant to succeed even on its own. <laughs> what does that mean? Small stateless systems 
And if one of them's down, the other one still should work. So if Netflix recommendation system is down, dead, well, does that mean that the ordering pipeline, when it goes to get recommendations, should die or display a bad error to the user? No. It should recognize that it's dead and carry on its way and maybe even make some static recommendations. Everybody sees the same recommendation. I mean, that's not as good as everybody doing personalized recommendation, but much better than being down. That's Rambo architecture. That's uh, designed defensively. Um, the advantage of the cloud here is that um, host failures will happen. Your virtual servers will go down, go away. Things will get corrupted. You can regenerate them. If you have the monitoring in place to automatically heal, that's even better. And recognize when a server is acting errantly and kill it because it's stateless, you didn't lose anything, and then respawn it. That's what that says, time to respawn. So if you shot ahead, you can respawn it. And short timeouts and quick retries. This has been found as an experience in the cloud. Which since the cloud is co-tenant, okay, you, you have your own space in the cloud, your own domain, and, and for all intents and purposes, it looks like your own private servers. But underneath the covers, again, you're sharing resources with other users. It is co-tenant. Because it's co-tenant, people have found that communication and interface calls tend to be more variable in terms of how long they take to execute or, what, or even their reliability. So one of the advantages that has been found is design with this short timeout and quick rapid retries. There are some servers that are actually send five that it has to call one server has to call another and it has to call the call the interface and get some information. It'll make five different calls of the same the same request. And whichever one comes back first, that's the one it takes, and then it goes on its merry way. And in order for that to happen, you need idempotent interfaces. But idempotent means that no matter how many times you call it, it's the same end state. The state doesn't change with multiple calls. Because if you're calling it multiple times, you might get multiple returns back. So that's some of the strategies you can do to, to embrace failure and avoid failure. And finally, the ability to research and test at full scale with real data. This is a cloud advantage. If, if um, a service with, with a thousand servers in a data center wants to test, they're probably going to set up some small test lab. But if you have a thousand cores in the cloud, you, if you're willing to pay for it, you could spin up a thousand cores in a quote unquote test lab. And you could even shunt share your data between the real system and the, and, and the, and the test lab. And you get a really close approximation of your production system in the cloud as a test sandbox. To be able to test, be able to test um, failures, right? Because you don't want to, pulling the plug on your actual in production system would be crazy, right? Killing servers on your in-production system would be crazy. Well, some of you saw the monkey here at Netflix. Well, it's what Netflix does. So Netflix actually has something called Chaos Monkey, which is a set of scripts that goes out and kills servers and services in their production instances in Amazon Web Services. Why would they do this? Because they have designed for failure. They embrace failure design for failure. And they know if they kill a service or a server, it should not be user impacting. And they're watching that, that <coughs> kill happen. And if it is user impacting, they quickly fix it. And they now have found a bug. That's testing. That's destructive testing in production. And it's a very valuable test. It's one that you want to be careful with. It's one that you have to engineer for. You don't, if your system's not designed for failure and not designed for high ability, don't run this test. You won't learn anything new. <laughs> but if it is designed for that, then run this test first in a lab because there's no reason to run it first in production. And if it works in the lab, then run it in production because production's a complex place and it's the only way you know it's going to work. They even have a chaos gorilla to simulate an outage during the entire availability zone. Um, now, Amazon does take out. When they te Amazon's testing their own services, they take out entire data centers. Amazon will send out an email a couple of days in advance saying, we're going to take out the Virginia data center on this date. The date rolls around, they send out some bogus email saying there's been a fire at the Virginia data center, and it's offline. And indeed, they take it offline. They don't actually power it down, I think they just cut off the network to it. But that, that data center's out. And Amazon services will go on happily running because most all Amazon services are designed to be geo redundant. Sarah, question. So, what's the end result? Even when Amazon Web Services is raining on Netflix's parade, they're they're, they're warm and dry inside their little cozy house. Mm -hmm. This refers to the April 2011 outage. If, and some of you might know that Amazon had another outage June of this year, June 2012 outage. It was due to a major thunderstorm. And again, took out an entire data center. Took out an entire availability zone. So Netflix should have been fine. They have chaos growth, right? The test for that? No, Netflix went down. 
you know, there's a few things that can be said about this. Basically, even in their blog, they, they admitted, they said, oh, chaos gorilla should have protected us against this. This has now taught us a lot more about how chaos gorilla needs to be redesigned to actually ensure that. Don't even learn. Am I scared you out of the cloud yet? There are the rewards. There are the rewards. There are too. <laughs> Talking about security here. The scary little more. Talking about security, right? So here's from a Microsoft security bulletin. Every cloud customer retains a responsibility for assessing and understanding. Basically, you retain the responsibility for your own security in the cloud, is what that's saying. There's, there, of course, there's guarantees offered. The guarantees offered is that hackers are not going to be able to access your stuff you know, through open interfaces. But the example is if you're uploading sensitive data to the cloud, encrypt it. There's no reason not to, right? I mean, you, you, the, the cloud providers provide providing guarantee that no one's going to access that data. But if you encrypt it and someone can access it, then they can't decrypt it. You're, you're just that much safer. You're taking security in your own hands. Yes? Um, I saw that the other slide you uh, showed like the geolocation of, of the data centers with yeah. the world, different countries and different rules of data security, and how, how secure your data is on your own servers. You know, right. You know, well, secure against the government, for instance. Yes, exactly. so that's not even a security issue. That's a policy issue. So US, USA Patriot, Patriot Act says uh, US government can look on US servers, I believe. I'm not speaking as a legal expert here. Don't quote me on that. That's my understanding of it. In China, they have specific rules about um, Azure's going to be putting some servers in China now. They have specific rules about what they're allowed to see, which has sort of been famously covered. So yeah, that's more of a policy issue. You should understand that, too. And actually, we don't cover that here, so thanks for raising that. Um, talking about security, we need to understand what an Amazon AMI is. Amazon AMI is an Amazon machine image. All it is basically is a virtual image uh, with operating system and software that you can create for, you, for your virtual server in Amazon EC2. But the cool thing about AMIs is, is, is they're sort of like ghost images. You can, down, you can download them and share them. So basically what this is showing here is that there's currently about 1,600 different AMIs you can use. If you're using Amazon Web Services, you can spin up AMIs that were created by Amazon themselves, created by the community, created by IBM, created by Microsoft, with all these operating systems on them, which is basically Windows and a thousand kinds of Linux. But all these operating systems, you can pick from any one of those, and, and you can find an AMI with that and use that AMI. So everybody clear on what an AMI is? It's just an image of an operating system that you can use on your server in Amazon. By the way, you can use Linux on Azure now, too. That was something new we announced over the summer. Really? No. Yeah, really. <laughs> um, so there's a key vulnerability issue around this, which is if you imagine an analogy where an AMI is like a house, and then an SSH key to your AMI is like a key to that house. Okay, the SSH key lets you access that server. So look at what happens. Someone creates an AMI. They create an Amazon machine image. Maybe it's Red Hat Linux, and they put a couple of things on it, and it has an SSH key associated with it, and they upload it to Amazon. They say, here, share my AMI. What happens to everybody who uses that AMI? Mm. They all have the same one key. It's like, it's like building a housing development where everybody has the same key. That's not very secure. I have this key, I can go to your house. This is in 2008 this happened. And Amazon, uh, Amazon saw that this was an issue, and they decided, OK, we'll fix this. What we'll do is make it automatically regenerate the SSH key every time we download an AMI. We're going to take this on us, this is on us, and, and we're going to fix it. So now whenever you download an AMI, it regenerates the SSH key. Everybody gets a fresh key. Loop closed, right? Now let's fast forward to 2011. Mm -hmm. This is sort of a similar issue. Now people were publishing their AMIs up to Amazon. They weren't, and it wasn't so much about the SSH keys, it was about their, their, their API authentication key. This is the key that lets you use Amazon Web Services. This unique key that every Amazon Web Services user has that lets them actually use Amazon Web Services and get charged for it. So it's like leaving your credit card in the house. And again, if everybody downloads this, they'll have access to your credit card. So is this, did Amazon look at this? Did they close the loop? No, what Amazon said was, read the freaking manual. <laughs> we have guidelines on how to create and share your AMIs. And one of those guidelines is don't include your authentication keys in it. If you do that, well, you kind of violate the agreement you're on your own. And this kind of falls in that case that you have to keep security in mind and, and be responsible for your own security. And don't do dumb things. So, that covers that. Up to this point, I feel like we've been going a little fast here, but I think it's a good pace. Any questions on anything we've spoken about so far? Yes. When you were talking about the, um, the geo 
data centers yeah. and geo distribution. And you were talking before about some of the data coming from the closest data center and the flow went down. And another time you talked about sort of pairing them. Is it is it really like going from the closest data center or are they just sort of pair as redundant? Well, uh, the load balancer um, will go to the next available data center. Like so it's possible. They, the load balancer logic could just be round robin, but it could be possible the load balancer logic says the closest one's really busy. <clears throat> this one's a little further away, but it's less busy, so I'll serve it from there. Right? But generally it's going to pick the closest one. Okay, I was thinking on in terms of the seeking issue, it would be really complicated if it was just going to any center rather than just pairing them. In terms of data? Yeah, like the data seeking. Oh, yeah, for the copy of the data. Yeah. yeah. It's usually, I will say that in the Bing scenario, it's usually something that's out of a kind of a geographic disaster area, but yeah, because copying data is so expensive, it's not going to be copied from California to Hong Kong. Right. It'd be you know, West Virginia to, to Chicago or something, probably. So at least that's what I know we do. I'm not sure about Amazon. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting question. You can try to make, the, sometimes people will not uh, serve the data from redundant locations, in which case you're still left with the same problem if your data is all in one place. You still got to make the round trip there. Sometimes it'll be local caching. There'll be a primary data ca data store somewhere, and then local caching, edge caching of the most important used data sure. in a different location. Um, some systems only care about eventual consistency, right? They, they actually like like an Amazon ordering system. If you go to Amazon, it says how many are in stock. And it says there's one in stock, sometimes you'll go to buy that one and you'll say, oh, we're out of stock. That's because Amazon doesn't insist on this absolute sinking. Amazon wants eventual, quick, but not immediate consistency. In which case, then you relax some of your constraints on how to sync the data across different data centers. Yes. If, uh, suppose with Azure, if, say, okay, we'll guarantee three nines availability. But in theory, can I increase that to five nines if I say, well, I'm going to add a lot of buffer for local NGO redundancy and, and say, you know, uh, can we just uh, scale up according, uh, rather than uh, the servers that we think can meet the current load, how about we double that? Uh, it's interesting you ask that because I think Azure's official SLAs are like, are actually 99.95 if you're in one data center and 99.999 if you're in two data centers. So Azure's actually recognize that, but they don't all do that. So I know some services too that actually run on more than one cloud provider, thinking that okay, then they'll give me other additional redundancy because they can't both mess up their software stacks at the same time. Right. Well, we suspect that was part of what Smug Mug did actually. Yeah, yeah, I think Apple does that with Amazon and Azure. Uh, no comment well. on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, cool. Big demo. <laughs> so all right, we're going to transition to testing in the cloud. So um, Facebook is a cloud platform, especially if you're creating an app, this is creating an app on Facebook. I don't know how many people, how many people ever created here a Facebook app? <coughs> no? yes. uh, if you're creating an app on Facebook, you get this, I don't need to read this. Yes, I would like free web hosting provided by Heroku. They teamed up with Heroku so that Heroku will host the app. Okay, otherwise you have that hosted on your own server. And when you're deploying and running these Facebook apps, this is, this is basically platform as a service. An example, Facebook's a platform on which you can run your application. The application, the end application itself, is software as a service to the end user. But you, as an application developer, see Facebook as platform as a service. And then, the reward, why is this good? Well, no need to host it yourself. You get instant scaling, that elasticity, and you get these options in terms of languages. If any of those are your choice, PHP, Node.js, Python, or Ruby, you get to use any of those four. So, if Facebook is a cloud platform then what are the risks of running your app in the cloud? In other words, how do we test it? Well, this stuff about testing I put here, does it work, is it stable? Are the users getting a good experience? None of these are cloud specific. This is just all you know, mother, mother and apple pie of testing, right? So we're testing our cloud app with the mother and apple pie of testing. But so these risks are not cloud specific, but one of the mitigations <coughs> it is, and that mitigation is the use of Facebook test users. So let me explain what that is. So Facebook's the cloud platform in this case. And you deploy, you create your app, and you want to test it. So I create an app, I want to test it, and my app actually requires, you know, about several dozen users to test it because they need to interact with each other and share things with each other, etc. So what do I do as an app developer? I go and create a bunch of Facebook users. They're free, free to create Facebook users, and I test my app, and I'm happy, and then I deploy my app. What's the downside of this? For Facebook, not for me, the app developer. What's the downside for Facebook and Facebook users? A lot of crappy fake users. 
And this happens enough. It actually would affect Facebook's counts of number of users and may even affect, you know, have legal implications, right? They don't want to have a bunch of crappy fake users around. So they created the concept of the Facebook test user. This is a sanctioned test user that can be created or destroyed programmatically, so you can script, you can automate your tests. And the Facebook users cannot see or be seen by real users. However, they can see other test users. So then you can use them to test your app. They can interact with each other. And all the time, it's partitioned off in the real world. This is an example of, of how one way to use uh, synthetic data handling in the cloud to test your cloud app. Yeah. So that was a couple hundred <laughs> users. How about one million users? I won't try to do my Dr. Evil imitation. Whoa. One million users. <laughs> For that, let's look at uh, Sosta. Sosta is a company that has a product called Cloud Test. And Cloud Test is, um, uses infrastructure as a service, or I've heard that pronounced as IaaS, which is really hard to say. <laughs> but infrastructure as a service uh, providers, like it, they use Azure or Amazon to deploy load agents to the cloud. Those load agents can be located all over the world, and they'll shoot load at your service, and they'll, they'll hit your service, and they'll measure response times and measure performance of your service. And they did this with MySpace, with one million concurrent virtual users. On top of real, the real usage, they added one million users. Six gigahertz per second, 77,000 hits per second, using 3,200 cloud computing cores to do that. So MySpace, kind of funny, I mean, they're still around, but it's, it's really impressive, the amount of load, amount of users that they were able to, to um, deploy for testing MySpace. Another example of how to use the cloud for testing, we're gonna go back to Netflix. Again, this is their streaming service hosted in Amazon Web Services. And their streaming services that receive about 1 billion API requests a day. And this blue set of blue servers you see here is some service that they're running in the Amazon cloud. There's the cloud. And the little smiley faces mean that each of those servers are carrying traffic. These are virtual servers carrying traffic. Now, I want to deploy the next version of my service. So I want to test it to make sure it's good enough to be deployed. So the way I test it is I spin it up in the cloud. This is red is vnext, blue is vcurrent, okay? And I spin it up in the cloud, it's not carrying any user traffic. I can do this because it's the cloud. That's the great thing about the cloud. I can spin up as many servers as I want. And now, I do the canary deployment. I put one of those servers so it's carrying real user traffic. And I let that run, maybe even overnight. And I compare it to these servers. And I say, how are the, how's the CPU consumption? Is there, are there any memory leaks? How's the error rates? If it looks bad, I'll roll it back. If it looks good, then I'll take all the traffic on my new, new version of the service and let that run overnight. Because at the 1 billion API requests per day scale, I might find something else I didn't find with the Canary deployment. And you know what? Those, they kept those author servers still in the cloud. It's the cloud. I can keep them there as long as I want. And the reason for that is if, if at, at scale I find a problem, I can roll back, right? But let's say there's no problem. Now it's the cloud. I deprovision those guys. And now I have deployed my vnext of the service tested and ready to carry real user traffic. So to continue talking about testing in the cloud, Ken's going to talk to you a bit about test-oriented architecture. So test-oriented architecture. Uh, if you've heard about, we run a little long, so I'm going to speed up here a little bit. It's a little past eight. Uh, test-oriented architecture. So you have service-oriented architecture. A lot of what we've been talking about is good cloud stuff. I'm going to talk to you about how do you basically allow yourself the ability to test better and safer in production and some of the techniques we've used inside of Microsoft, inside of Bing, that I think you might be able to use as you move into the cloud. They're not very easy to use without a cloud, but you can use them uh, in the cloud. So i got to start off with my Ken's theorem of services. Here's the thing. Services. Services are like ogres. Ogres are like onions. Onions have layers, and therefore services have layers. The thing you need to take away from this, though, is that services have layers, but the problem with that is that the layers are all spinning at different rates. So a cloud, Seth told you about the different kinds of things. You've got software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. You have all of these layers. Guess what? They are revving constantly in the cloud. Azure is updating all those pieces all the time. Office 365 is updating stuff. Your cloud is not stable. It is changing constantly. You must accept that there's no such thing as, what is the version of my operating system? What is the version of my cloud? It's what it was the second that transaction happened. It might be something different the next second. 
So it's constantly changing and constantly changing. So you're in an unstable environment. So now how do you deal with services when you can't sign off and say, oh, I'm done. It works with this cloud and it's done because the cloud isn't always the same cloud. So here, let me talk to you a little bit about code churn. This leads into this, but I'd like to bring this up. One other thing I found with cloud computing is that most organizations, as they move to the cloud, if they were not into agile development, they tend to get into agile development. Mm -hmm. One of the things about being able to deploy quickly and easily is one of the things that keeps a lot of companies that are doing services from doing agile development. But when you're in the cloud, you can do it fairly quickly and easily once you learn it. So here's the thing to think about. All right, let's say you've got four developers. Four developers code for one week. The amount of code that four developers can write in one week is a relatively static thing for that team. That amount of code is code churn, right? That goes into the source system, you've got X amount of code. If those developers code for six weeks, every week there's the same amount of code that basically goes into the system. So over the course of six weeks, you'll have six weeks of code or six weeks of code churn that will build up in the system. What's the maximum point of risk? One of the things we do in Microsoft is when we ship Office and it takes three years, we have big coding milestones, big stabilization milestones. A lot of waterfalls about these big coding milestones and big stabilization. Maximum point of risk. Now imagine that you're in a service that has lots of layers, right? <clears throat> Each one of those layers is doing a large, uh, a large uh, bit of coding and then you try to sim ship all of those layers at the same time. That's fairly traditional services development and shipping. The maximum point of risk is the moment that you're done with the coding milestone and you're trying to get that code ready to ship. The next biggest um, uh, point of risk is when you deploy that code to production because you're changing a lot of production all at once. Let's take a look at it in case you were at a, uh, let's see, oh yeah, and the other thing too is that when you sim ship, the layers are tightly coupled. If you're gonna ship together, one of the first things that always happens, people say, oh, I wanna be loosely coupled. And then they try to sim ship and they go, oh, well, we don't, we'll break backwards compatibility this time because it's better than trying to re-architect it. So we'll just make it work this time together and we'll ship together. So you always end up, if you sim ship, you'll always end up tightly coupled. You need to, uh, you need to break your shipping cycles apart. So let's take a look at kind of a continuous deployment model, or let's say you're doing a one or two week sprint and you ship every two weeks or every week. In this case, this is a weekly example. You now take that same code example and you deploy that code at the end of every single week. Your risk stays constant, it's flat. It's a flat amount of risk over that entire six weeks, except that true, the maximum point of risk at, at the end of six weeks is actually still in production. Oops is still in production. The maximum point of risk is always right there with what's running today. Okay, but it is controlled, but it'll build up over time in the release. Another thing to think about is let's say we have different layers that are releasing at different rates, each one of them updating at their own pace. That'll produce loose coupling, but you still have the maximum point of risk is production. And the whole point of this is when you get into the cloud and you increase your ship rate, you spend more time testing the current version of the service in the cloud than you actually do the next version because the cloud is changing and all the components that aren't your component up and down the stack are changing as well. So your tests now become tests that run constantly in production. We call this continuous production testing. You wrote the test, run it in production. That's one of the things that's big and different as you start to speed up your rate. Uh, so let's talk about test-oriented architecture and how you can make that work for you. Here's a couple of tips. We've already talked a little bit about loose coupling. Uh, loose coupling is about breaking things up. Um, you'll want to have loosely coupled layers up and down the stack. Um, and the loose coupling supports better, better agility. Uh, we know, I'm not allowed to say what we do inside of Microsoft because we like to be secret. But I will tell you that Facebook and Google have said that they ship multiple times a day. I can't tell you how often we ship because we don't publicly talk about it. But we're actually pretty agile, I'll say that. Anyhow, so if you're shipping multiple times a day, you're actually going to create fairly loosely coupled services. They're not going to be married and tied at the hip. Individuals can make the decision that says, hey, my service works for what it was supposed to and it doesn't break backward compatibility with the existing components, therefore I can roll it forward. And in fact, a lot of services that are loosely coupled, I'll say this, we know that we will enable new capabilities, maybe new APIs, We'll push them to production, and when the other layer is ready, it will update their code to take advantage of the new API. And maybe they'll find a bug in our API when they do that, but as long as they're forward and backward compatibility, compatible when they roll out, we can go fix that bug in that API layer, and then they can turn the feature on for the rest of the world. Using some of those other things, we're going to talk about the Canary deployments. So this was, dang, we got to like, present from our own laptop next time. Anyhow, so Canary deployments. The other thing I wanted to say about that is when you do the loose coupling, back to the assess thing, when you're doing it by each layer, 
you every time each layer rolls out, it does a canary deployment for that component. That way, if there is a bug left in that one for the forward and backward compatibility, you take it out of rotation, and then you can go forward. Same with when you're upgrading and taking advantage of a new feature, you do it in a canary deployment, you can roll it back. That's good testability. Deployment is a testability component. It allows you to mitigate risk. In fact, in the cloud and in services testing, a lot of what testing is about is risk mitigation. You gotta think about the features and the techniques you can have. So self-serve deployment, what are the things that allow you to do self-serve or continuous deployment? Uh, deployments and most organizations like Google and Facebook, and I can't say what we do inside of Microsoft because we don't talk about it publicly, devs and test can deploy. Individual developers and testers can make the decision to deploy. The automatic deployment system allows you to automatically rotate forward. You can do that kind of side by side that Seth showed with big versions of them side by side. You can fork your traffic. You can do the canary zone, things like that. Uh, and the big thing is that you need to have it all hooked up with your monitors so that it automatically triggers rollback. Triggering rollback automatically through your test automation is a testability component. You have your tests running continuously and they have the ability to say, hey, I failed, throw an alert. If there's an appointment going, stop it and roll it back. As you, in, as you decrease the time to mitigation, you're actually, a, you're, you can release more often because the risk is controlled. So you can push more deployments because if it is a bad one or there's a bug that got missed, it'll automatically roll back. Ah, so like I said, test cases are now part of the product. You will ship your test cases. Most service organizations inside of Microsoft are shipping tests to production these days. They run as a service. The great thing as a test person is, hey, I don't tend to do any feature work. Tests are features. They interact with the service. You're actually a feature developer if you're writing automated test cases. So you want to think about this. Uh, there's a chapter in, the, in Dorothy Graham's book that I co-authored on experiences in test automation where we talk a lot about what we do in exchange and how many thousands of test cases run every 10 minutes against Office 365, constantly probing and finding defects and regressions. Uh, and again, the regression can be simply from a hard disk failure within the system that we didn't anticipate, but the automated test might catch it, and so now we know how to harden the service for a particular fault that we hadn't actually mirrored in production or in, in a test environment. Uh, next, ship your test hooks. Uh, te ship your test hooks into production. Test hooks are important. I'm going to walk you through this and be the last key point. Uh, test hooks, a lot of times we say, oh, you can't ship into production because that increases your security risk. If you have a back door to the service to be able to figure something out, you can't do blah, blah, blah. The thing is, is you can't actually debug in production if you don't have access to those test hooks. Let me give you some examples here of testability in production. Uh, yeah. So this is a typical service stack. You might have some front end or front door servers. You might have some authentication, a couple of other components that do something in there. You might have some storage, right? Typical service. When the user hits the service, <coughs> the traffic flows through the production stack. It hits all the components, right? It flows right through. One of the very common things that you might do in a service uh, for testability is that you would design test hooks, and we actually have these in some of our services, where you can pass extra parameters into that traffic. And that parameter, and this is true for Google, parts of Microsoft, and I have no idea about Facebook or Amazon, but I know Google's talked about it, where you can pass a flag in. It can hit his, let's say this is the vNext version of your service. You want to make sure that it's safe. So you actually route with test flags, not really users. You round test traffic through that next version before you take it online, before you even do those first users to it. You simply pass extra parameters and say, hey, hit version two of the API. You know, you just have, to have an extra tag that says which version of the API to hit. So it, it tests that one, and it'll find it in the stack. Um, another scenario that we know that people have talked about in some cloud environments, you can actually have your dev box, or let's say the, the developer is coding and it's a private check-in. Push it into the cloud. So as a private build off of my own machine, I'm pushing it into the cloud, and I pass this test hook into the traffic to hit this private build to see if it works. I don't need to have a lab anymore. I just push my personal machine build out to there as a test VM, and I have hooks that I can pass through runtime flags to be able to hit that. It could be your test cluster, you can have a few things on the side, you want to do some destructive tests, you just hit it there. You have the rest of the stack is what's current, so you don't have to rebuild it. You just take what you need into the components you want. So ship your test hooks. A common way to harden against that is that if you have some sort of like a private cloud, 
via simply they don't allow any extra parameters uh, through the firewall that aren't from your, your corporate instance. That's the most common thing. So these test hooks can only be accessed by employees. So that's the most common architecture. You can do other things where you might have to have a certificate to be able to pass through. So you have a test certificate so you know you're a client, you can use the extra hooks there. Those are two good ways to harden your service fairly quickly. The next thing for testability or test-oriented architecture is telemetry. When you ship all the time, your data is as important as your tests. In fact, your tests also run all the time. Your tests are telemetry. So you now have continuous tests that provide telemetry. You analyze that, and if it changes, something changed in the system. Ergo, if it changes in a good way, that was a good fix. If it changes in a bad way, there was a bad fix. Ergo, there's a regression. I should go look at it. Latency increased in production. I should go look at it. Latency decreased. Oh, good. The fix worked. You know, your tests. We have a 99.9% .9 pass rate. Suddenly it's 99.8% pass rate. Let's go take a look and see which ones are failing. So your telemetry will tell you a lot about whether or not your service is healthy. And a lot of the future test jobs, and I do a separate talk on this called Big Data and Quality, a lot of the future test jobs are, an are analytic jobs. You analyze the telemetry and you find the faults. You don't test for them, you find them. And I think that's it. So Seth and I went along. We have all sorts of fun stuff. He and I have done this a couple of times. Really appreciate having you having all having us out here. Um, we love talking the cloud, like sharing some of our experiences. And we got a few minutes for some questions. And I think that's it, right, Seth? Yeah. So let's leave this up and take some questions. We're gonna take some questions. Anybody? Mm -hmm. we'll go along yep. Sure. Go uh, in uh, telemetry tests, as you said, the future need for testers in telemetry. So you you have. Um, basically the metrics on the tests passing, but then are you looking at individual tests that might fail or start passing, for example, from one deployment to the next or deployment of one uh, component to the next? And is, um, or are, are you looking at individual test cases or maybe it, metrics? Like it depends upon, so all of those are true. It's very hard to say, oh, I've got one million test cases, let me analyze all one million to see which ones failed. Right. Uh, so you could do it. Uh, some of the things we do is we tend to look for Variability. So let's say you have a test that typically passes, but sometimes it doesn't. So if the variability of it passing changes, because sometimes it's valid because a lot of the test automation maybe isn't written as robust, so you might have a timeout problem uh, with the test, but you don't bother to fix it. You know that, hey, it's basically 99% of the time this one passes, but if there's some problem, maybe it fails. So unless it gets down to 95%, you don't bother looking at it. It's something that would heal the production very Yeah, yeah, sometimes, sometimes again with cloud, it could be that the cloud is failing over at that point or something like that, so maybe you don't look at it. We do some things in Bing where we do variability because we do machine learning, and so we want to see what the variability of queries are. And again, it's also, back. somebody mentioned data-driven services. A lot of services these days, the data is the service. Like I work on the, web, on the Windows uh, App Store, the data is more, as much as important as the service, but the data changes. So apps get deleted, apps get updated, apps get updated with bad uh, attributes that get set somehow, and somehow it's not surfacing correctly. So if Angry Birds Star Wars stops showing up tomorrow because the Angry Birds team made a change and they made a mistake when they made it and it disappeared, mm -hmm. well, that's a bug that people will blame Microsoft for, so right. I have to make sure that that gets caught and fixed. So the data also changes, so you're watching for variability. But the biggest thing I would say is to learn how to analyze the organic telemetry, the stuff that comes out of the system naturally. So what are the usage patterns of the system? What are the typical latencies? What are the typical faults? And use that as, as one of your top sources. We call, we call uh, the tests that run in the cloud against production more the synthetic telemetry. You still have to have that. The great thing about the synthetic is that it can hook up to your canaries or to your, to, to your automatic rollback. And it gives you mean time to detection improvement. Because if there is a hard failure or a big regression, that'll catch it faster than the organic telemetry. The organic telemetry will give you more of a signal of, of softer faults where user behavior might be changing. Like if people use your service less or start using a feature less, did latency on that feature go up? Or did it suddenly, did you suddenly accidentally change the UX and now it's harder to find? Mm -hmm. Things like that. Uh, so those are two things, but that's a whole other talk. Go, yeah. We can talk afterwards if you want. Any other questions? That's it. No? Okay. We went long, sorry man. <laughs> Okay, some contact information on here too. If anybody needs, has any questions or anything, there's a lot of references in here too, but. <laughs>
contact information. I was on the first slide. If you want to contact us, come see us after the talk. We'll give you a talk. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. So uh, I want to thank you both for, for kind of set that light. You've been here before. Ken Johnson, uh, it, uh, and for my book, you, one of the best presentations we've had in 11 years. So, so thanks very much for coming. And uh, as tradition goes, we let the presenters pick the uh, door prize. So if you guys all right. want to choose who's going to do it. Yeah, one. Okay. And this one. is for a uh, $25 Starbucks gift. Rush beer. Yeah, and thanks everybody for participating and, and happy holidays to everyone and thank you again. Thank okay. you.